today I'm going to talk about um, zoonotic diseases and how globalization has um, kind of affected some of these and caused some of these diseases to um, proliferate. So the reason, one of the, um, I guess, inspirations for this talk was this book. It was a book that um, Dr. Mai, my, my old um, internal medicine program director, gave me on graduation. Um, and I think she thought it was supposed to be like kind of a fun fun read, um, and it, it was really interesting. Um, it, he talks a lot uh, on a medical uh, level as well as um, kind of on a layman's term, and he tells the history of these diseases and these stories, or, or, or these diseases and how they evolved in more of a story format, so it's really interesting if any of you guys are interested in learning more about um, zoonotic diseases. All right, so uh, to start with, we have to kind of um, learn, could back up to what the, the um, definition of a zoonotic disease is. So according to uh, Mandel's, uh, zoonotic disease or zoonosis is an infection, uh, infectious disease of humans that originates in animals. So very simple definition in, in that aspect and we can apply it to in different ways. So when thinking about zoonotic diseases, the, it's important to remember how they got from the animal to the human. So there's a few different ways of transmission. And I think we, we think about these a lot in, in the specific life cycle. For example, when we're talking about Zika or, or some of those diseases, we know that there's a way for it to, uh, for the disease to get from person to person or from animal to person. But if you think about how it ever got to, from animal <coughs> to person, you, kinda, you um, can back up and look at some of these processes. So the first one is, um, transmission from a live animal reservoir um, to a human. Um, and so this is, is um, when the animal is still alive and the virus um, is in some way gets into the, into the living human. There's um, also um, dead animals or reservoirs that uh, infect the human. So this is often seen um, in um, a meat reservoir, bush meat, or um, trans transferring viruses from the animals to the humans. Um, there's also a, a reservoir that use intermediate hosts or amplifying hosts, um, and we can see this, uh, you, we'll see this example a few times um, in pigs. And then there um, is also reservoirs that are vectors, and we think about these with our mosquitoes with, when we talk about malaria um, and Zika and some of the other flavia viruses. Uh, and so one of the things when you're thinking about if, you, if you've already, if you know that the virus can affect, go from an animal to a person, um, that's one type of transmission. Um, but then it's also important to look at some of the diseases that we know have affected, caused pandemics or affected a lot of people. And, and the viruses are also not just capable of jumping from animal to human species, but also from going from human to human. So different modes of transmission, um, such as sexual contact, respiratory, um, uh, iatrogenic, as we see with medicine occasionally. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about, uh, throughout this talk, we'll talk about a diff few different types of infections that can can transmit, and mostly we're going to focus on viruses. So this topic is is pretty big when we talk about zoonotic diseases. So it's it would be impossible to cover all of this in one hour. Um, it would probably take a whole semester of class to cover all the different zoonotic diseases. So today we'll mostly focus on a lot of the the viral zoonotic diseases. Um, and when we we kind of break down how the viruses are so successful at being um, zoonotic diseases. Um, we can we look at we can look at them between DNA and RNA viruses. So, um, and I'm making this pretty simple. We all know that there's double-stranded and single-stranded DNA viruses, and um, also single and double-stranded RNA viruses. But when you look at some of the basics between the DNA and RNA, you can understand why the RNA viruses are typically more successful at becoming um, epidemics or pandemics. Um, so when you have your uh, DNA virus, they're usually double-stranded, except those uh, exceptions we were talking about. Um, they're, because they're double-stranded, they're usually more stable. Um, and the reason that they're more stable is they, because they have a DNA polymerase, which um, it essentially proofreads the uh, replication process. So anytime there is a, um, a, a um, 
A or a, a, a nucleotide base that is put down incorrectly, the, the mm. DNA polymerase can proofread it and correct it. Um, so, of course, this process is slower because of the proofreading process. RNAs are usually single-stranded, other than RNA viruses are usually single-stranded, other than those exceptions, too. Um, but they have a higher mutation rate because they don't have this polymer DNA polymerase that is constantly going back and um, checking the virus. So you see uh, um, a lot more errors in, in essentially mutations in the RNA viruses. So as we talk about um, the viruses today, kind of keep that in mind and, and how we're going to get the virus from the animal um, reservoir to the human. So when we, when we think about how these viruses have uh, evolved, we have to consider what has happened in, in, in globalization and how humans have, have kind of essentially caused some of these pandemics. Um, and so the World Health Organization has a really uh, a detailed definition of globalization. So they say that globalization or the increased interconnectedness and interdependence of people's countries is generally understood to include two interrelated elements. Uh, the opening of international borders to increasingly fast flows of goods, services, finance, people, and ideas, and the change in institutions and policies at the national and international levels that facilitate or promote such flows. Globalization has the potential for both positive and negative effects on the development of health. So that's kind of a lot of words to, I think, describe that there's a connection between different um, countries and flow and people and ideas and, and really all of this uh, can affect disease, affect healthcare, um, and our policies and uh, politics also affect, affect these epidemics. Um, so when we, one thing to kind of, I wanted to back up and focus on a little bit too is that a lot of the diseases are affected by us and our ability to um, uh, have transportation that, that we can get kind of across the world and, and essentially be capable of spreading a disease um, within a, a very short period of time. So if we look at the, uh, if we look at this timeline, we can, uh, we can connect a lot of our, our pandemics that we know of and, and also relate them to the progress we made in um, in transportation. Um, we can also connect it to the kind of two big events where a lot of these pandemics happened where was World War One and World War Two. So keeping that in the back of your mind too, a lot of transportation was either um, increased due to the movement of soldiers or decreased due to um, um, uh, the amount of goods and availability that there was in the world at that time. So in uh, 1903 was the first flight which occurred by the Wright brothers. So I have to include that because it's from my home state in North Carolina and we fight with Ohio a lot, but we are the first in flight. <laughs> um, and then in, um, after 1910, um, there was a lot of different uh, aircrafts that were, were made and developed. And a lot of this was uh, in preparation for making fighter uh, planes for World War I. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 1919, whenever we had commercial aviation, and these were just small little, like five passenger planes at this point. Um, so they weren't transporting what we, we currently know. Um, in 1927, there was the uh, uh, first transatlantic flight by Charles Lindbergh, and that's his little plane, uh, model of his little plane down there. Um, and then in 1932, Amelia Earnhardt was the first woman to fly across the, the do a transatlantic solo flight. Um, and then in 1933, we had really what we're, we're more, we more know of as commercial airplanes. So um, Boeing made a 247. Um, and then in 1938, we had our first pressurized cab cabins. And we continue to go on throughout World War II. Some of the um, commercial uh, uh, progress in commercial jets were delayed until after World War II. Um, and then in 1949, we see um, uh, some of those the jet, actual jet planes increasing, but it wasn't until 1958 where we really started to produce them. And then Boeing had the 747 in um, 1960s. So if you kind of go through all that, there's a lot of the diseases today that we're going to talk about that went through that timeline and were affected by all of this. Um, 
And as you can see, their um, aviation does have an effect on um, the transmission of infections. This was a flight map that I did um, on Saturday morning at 8.45 in the morning. So all those planes were like currently in the air at that point, according to the sh flight tracker. Um, and they estimated that there's greater than 100,000 flights uh, per day, or 10,000 flights per day, and 36.8 million flights in occurred in the year of 2017. So if you can imagine, if there's just a small infection on any of one, in one of every of that plane and you transmit it to a different location, you're gonna spread a lot of disease. Um, so things that um, also, to keep in mind that can spread disease through the through um, transportation, specifically with planes, is that during um, travel, passengers are at increased risk for infection due to the high density of the layout and the seating, so everybody's close together. Um, there's low humidity and hypobaric oxygen and recirculation of oxygen. I didn't include that there too. That also increased um, the likelihood of transmitting infections between the passengers in the plane. Um, okay, so. The first one I want to talk about, I think there's an important lesson to discuss with smallpox, even though smallpox is not a zoonotic disease, so I want to make sure that, that I made that um, clear, but I, it has um, a few educational points that I think will be good to kind of carry forward. Um, so this disease does demonstrate how globalization affects the spread of disease, but also teaches us an important lesson on eradication too. So. The, the Great Southeastern uh, smallpox epidemic occurred in 1696 and lasted till the 1700. Um, and it began in, the, in 1650. Uh, the Virginia traders uh, ventured into the uh, Carolinas and um, that's kind of how they followed the, the um, river patterns and, and created their trade routes. Um, it wasn't, they, they think that the uh, smallpox arrived through the African slave ships and then was able to be transmitted through those trade, um, trade routes. And, and most of the trade routes were stimulated by um, either slaves or, or rum trade. Um, those were the key players that, that were thought to assist with the spread of smallpox. Um, so this is a map that kind of shows the, the spread of the of smallpox. So the, the black arrow is the, the trade routes and then the dotted arrow is where they think smallpox had spread. Um, and the little plus signs are where they had uh, a, a depopulation. So a lot of, of the Native Americans were affected by smallpox um, and caused, caused a lot of, of deaths at the, during that period of time. So in, the in 1980, the World um, Health Organization declared that smallpox had been eradicated. So through, eventually we, we were able to create vaccines and eradicate smallpox. So the um, diseases had, it, something that they focus on when they, when they talk about creating vaccines in order to eradicate um, diseases is that most of the diseases are not zoonotic that we're able to create vaccines for and that we've been able to eradicate. Um, having an animal reservoir can lead to recurrent outbreaks of disease and what makes these diseases so unpredictable and difficult, um, that's what makes them so difficult to treat and prevent. So the first one that's a zoonotic disease that I want to talk about is yellow fever. Um, so yellow fever is a flavivirus. It's uh, present in the tropical South American and sub um, Saharan Africa um, and it typically presents with fever, headache, and myalgias and begins abruptly accompanied by conjunctival injection, <coughs> facial flushing, and relative bradycardia, the Faget sign. Um, and eventually it leads to icteric hepatitis and hemorrhage. Um, so one way they th say you can differentiate this too from some of the other hemorrhagic uh, viral infections is, is the, or, or uh, hepatitis is, is uh, checking for albuminuria. Um, Okay, so the um, yellow fever was uh, known as the American plague. Um, it first appeared in 1648, and the first definition or definitive evidence of yellow fever in the, the Americans, the Americas, was in this, the Mayan manuscripts, and it was suspected at that time to be imported from West Africa through trade ships, similar to the, with the trade um, trade ships as as um, some of the other viruses. 
1668 through 1699, the outbreaks occurred all throughout the East Coast. Um, but it wasn't until 1848 um, that they realized that the vec there might be a vector, and the vector was probably mosquitoes. Um, so at that point, um, uh, it was 1898, so several years later, it started causing problems for the U.S. Army. Um, and that's when Walter Reed got involved and um, assisted with trying to eradicate uh, yellow fever through eradication of mosquitoes. Um, so in 1900, the um, Reed Yellow Fever Commission proved that yellow fever uh, infection is transmitted to humans by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And then 1905, um, after doing that and, and focusing on eradication me uh, measures, we were able to eradicate yellow fever. Um, 1930, uh, there, in 1930, there were two yellow fever vaccines that were developed, the 17D vaccine and the French neurotropic vaccine. So when we're thinking about uh, yellow fever, there's two different life cycles to, to keep in mind, and this can be applied to many different zoonotic diseases. We talk about it with Zika more recently, um, but n knowing the two different life cycles, the, the life cycles, the jungle and the urban. So um, with the jungle, um, this is kind of the natural life cycle of the mosquito affecting the monkey, the monkey um, uh, then getting bit by another mosquito and the life cycle continues to spread the disease. Um, when the, a human is affected is when that, that mosquito that's part of that kind of jungle life cycle bites a human and then that human goes into the urban population and there are, are appropriate mosquitoes that will are able to spread it from human to human. Um, and then there's also the intermediate or savanna life cycle too, which usually just occurs in Africa when there's very close populations of both um, animals or monkeys and humans in the same environment. Um, so that, that uh, discusses yellow fever. So the next one is uh, the flu. So there's a lot of different things to talk about with the flu. Um, so the, the 1918 Spanish flu is probably one of the most well-known pandemics and zoonotic diseases. Um, so in, in um, January of 1918 through April of, not 2019, that's an error there, um, 1919, the Spanish flu affected the Americas and it really became a pandemic. Um, the origin is unknown. However, there's several different theories that exist on how the how influenza originated at that time, and and probably the most well accepted is that it started in Kansas, where there was a high population of hog farmers that also lied within um, in that farming area. There was a bird migratory pattern, um, and so at that time it was proposed that. There, because of the hogs and the, the birds, the native birds, that there probably could have been um, a, a um, uh, the zoonotic disease could have been kind of spread. So it, um, when in Kansas, um, it was proposed that it was transmitted, transmitted through um, France by soldiers in World War I. So basically it went from Kansas, and you can see those kind of lines up there, the red lines, over to the um, eastern side of the United States, and then because of the sol soldiers traveling across the um, globe because of the World War, eventually going into Europe. Uh, but it really, it didn't gain much of attention until it affected the uh, Spanish king, and when he contracted the illness, he it became known as the Spanish flu. So it's kind of a misnomer, it wasn't, wasn't uh, first, it, it's not originated in Spain. So in September, of that year, it spread by Navy ship to Philadelphia. So um, once it got to from uh, into Philadelphia, um, they had noticed that a lot of the soldiers were sick, and they expected them to have this influenza virus. Um, but they had there was a big parade, the Liberty Loan Parade, that was planned for later in that month on September 28th. Um, so the they, the city decided to continue with the parade. Um, however, many of the, the people that attended the uh, parade ended up becoming ill, and it, uh, they ended up having 12,000 people in Philadelphia that were that ended up dying because of the influenza virus, and it's proposed that because of the parade, it spread more rapidly. Um, so interestingly, with the Spanish flu, it, has, it had three different waves. So 
there was the first wave, second wave, and the third wave. And the second wave was the, was the more deadly wave. This, this graph represents the deaths in the UK, um, just because they had the best, at that time they were keeping the, the best data. But it's proposed that that's kind of how the wave um, uh, was in the Americas and, and throughout the rest of Europe. So it's the, currently still the deadliest disease outbreak that has been known, and it killed 500 to 100 million people it's estimated to have, have killed. So when we're talking about influenza, so now we know kind of how deadly and powerful this disease was, but to understand why this occurred, we have to back up and know a little bit more about the microbiology of influenza. So there's um, two different important uh, uh, parts of influenza, so hemagglutinin and neuramidase. So these are both surface proteins or spikes that are on the outer um, surface of the influenza virus. Um, so there's 16 different types of hemagglutin and nine different types of neuramid neuraminidase. Um, and these uh, lead to the different types of, 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 of uh, influenzas that we kind of know about today. So the big shifts are whenever we have reassortment, re, uh, and then the smaller ones, the antigenic drift, is when we have minor mutations in these viruses. So, um, humans typically are only affected with H1, 2, and 3, um, but H9 and H5 have also been uh, known to affect humans, but so far when they do affect humans, they're not known to have human-to-human -human transmission. So, um, Kind of going back to where the influenza virus originated, we know that we know we now know that waterfowl is a reservoir for the influenza viruses, and um, it's the as you can see over on the left hand side, there the um, the influenza kind of lives in, within the waterfowl, and all of the different types of hemagglutinin that are are found on the influenza have been found in the waterfowl. Um, they can go from domestic uh, into domestic birds, and sometimes they make them ill, and sometimes they they don't. Um, but the the swine or the pig has been known to be the uh, mixing vessel for the viruses. So essentially, the viruses will go into um, a form that affects the human and affects the birds. Can go in uh, both infect the swine, and that's how we get the new um, different strains of the flu, and therefore causing something that the human population hasn't been exposed to, which would, would be more of the antigenic um, drift. So the next, the biggest topic I think we're going to talk about today is HIV. So this one, um, we'll talk a little bit about the discovery of HIV first. So it was first discovered, um, and, and actually I wouldn't say it was discovered, but there, there was awareness in 1981. Um, that about a cluster of cases in U, uh, UCLA that the patients all had PJP pneumonia and candida infections um, and were noticed to, noted to have depleted T cells. Um, this was reported in the MMWR in, in June of 1981. Um, so this physician, he noticed all these different cases and realized that there was something alarming of, of this and, and had it posted in there. It wasn't until 1983, and there were several clusters after that, um, but we'll go into all the details, but it wasn't until 1983, though, that, um, that Montagnier and Gallo, um, he was in Paris and Gallo was in Bethesda, they both published at the same time in Science uh, magazine in May about a, a virus that they discovered that was associated with these with these, uh, this clinical presentation, and it was essentially a syndrome at that point. So between 1981 and 1983, there were a lot of different names that had been kind of given to the virus or given to what they thought was a virus or the syndrome that was associated with it. But these, this is the first time they actually identified something that could cause it. And they each had their own name for the virus. So um, uh, one was lymphadenopathy virus, or LAD, and then um, Gallo named it after the other HTLV viruses that were studied, and he named it HTLV3. Um, in 1985, um, the importantly, um, Conkey and Essex discovered SIV. So at this point, the question was, where did this virus come from? Um, so people started looking into um, 
uh, monkeys and chimpanzees and because they had noticed that some of their monkeys were having similar illnesses in, in the labs. So they discovered um, SIV in 1985 and they published their work in Science. Um, and the, uh, uh, they discovered this in the um, macaque monkeys that they had in, in a laboratory. So la S SIV was later found to be in three different monkeys, the African green monkeys, the um, rhesus, uh, and the sooty ma manga bays. Um, but it wasn't until 1989 that somebody had really established an association between HIV uh, and the SIV, those viruses. And this was um, Hirsch and Korb. So they established that between, um, and this was HIV-2 actually, rather than um, HIV-1. And they proposed that SIV in an African city, Mangabe, infected a human resulting in HIV-2. So they made a pretty bold statement in their paper, um, kind of creating this relationship between the two viruses. And at that point, um, identifying HIV as a zoonotic disease. So that's like a super brief history of what kind of happened between 81 and 89, um, but some of the big points to touch upon. So um, the question at that point, once it was decided that it was, or a, a common thing that was talked about, once it was decided it was or thought to be a zoonotic disease, how did it get from um, the reservoir um, monkey or chimpanzee to humans? So there was a few different theories. One was the um, cut, uh, cut hunter hypothesis, so that the, a hunter that was hunting these uh, monkeys was directly contaminated from the animal to the humans during preparation of meat. The other one which I thought was um, interesting is the oral polio vaccination theory, um, which there was a, um, they, are, they were promoting polio vaccination in Africa in 1958, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, and then the third, the third proposal was that hypodermic syringes could be contributing. And in particular, there, were, there was um, uh, urge to, to eradicate um, trypano, trypanosomiasis and um, other venereal diseases. And there was a clinic in that um, was giving medications to eradicate these venereal diseases. Um, and specifically, they were uh, doing this for a lot of the sex workers in Africa. So in 2006, so that kind of, keep that in the back of your mind while we're, they're trying to figure out um, how it did get to, into humans. So in 2006, um, using uh, dip genomics, Keel showed that chimpanzees from Cameroon carried a very similar SIV to HIV-1, um, therefore suspecting that they were the reservoirs. So the, the, we already, as, we kind of established earlier that we thought that there was a certain strain of SIV that was associated with HIV-2, but they didn't know until 2006 or really connect the, um, until 2006 that SIV and HIV-1 were connected. Um, in 2008, um, there was an analysis of preserved blood samples um, and lymph nodes that revealed two different sequences. So there is a ZR59 and a DRC60 is the names that they just gave them. Um, and using genetic trees and time models, they were able to predict that HIV-1 was circulating as early as 1908. Um, so that's a lot um, earlier than they, than if you go back to when we were talking about it presenting in, in America in the 1980s, um, this is quite a bit earlier. Um, and then also that genetic tree and the, the kind of dating it back to 1908 also had another important um, interest because there was still the question of why, uh, how it ended up getting from humans to, or from animals to humans. And that pol the, there was a lot of pressure on, on the, the fact that the polio vaccination could be contributing to it. Um, but the polio vaccination did not occur until 1958. So this kind of cleared that um, that theory of being the cause of of the zoonotic disease. Uh, and so here is a map that shows what the proposed transmission was. So looking at um, one, this is where the they were saying they're they're labeling it as the the butcher of the chimpanzees. But of course, we don't know that that was definitely what occurred. Um, 
following the river where the blue dots are, going down to number two um, along the river, and then going to the city of uh, Ken Kinshasa, um, where the epidemic of the proposed epidemic of HIV um, began and then spread throughout the world. So, um, in Kinshasa, um, there were only 10,000 10, people in 1908 uh, predicted, um, and it was a very isolated town. But in 1890, 1898, a railroad was built um, into that area, and by 1940, the population increased to 49,000. So to kind of think about globalization and how it could affect disease, um, introducing modern transportation into that city um, could have contributed to the disease spread, um, eventually leading to disease spread to America and, the re and Europe and the rest of the world. Okay. Um, and, and this is just to kind of represent that um, once the disease was present, it, w it did transmit and may not have made itself known until later into the 1980s, but um, through looking at different genetic models, they have traced it back to different areas. Um, it's thought that in 1966, HIV made its way to Haiti, and then between 1969 and 1972, that's when it probably traveled into the Americas. Um, and then about 10, later, 10 years later when we started seeing the syndromes that we currently identify as HIV. Um, so the next one that we'll talk about is um, SARS. So uh, the, this one is one that I think um, a little more modern in the last uh, 10 years, I remember being in, in high, I think high school whenever this, this one was occurring. Um, the first case was reported in November of 2002, um, and it was associated with a province in southern China. Uh, it's thought that the reservoir is probably the horseshoe bat with an intermediate host of, of civet cats. That was the original thought. Um, they identified it in both of these um, animals, however, they, it's, not, it's not been uh, kind of clearly proven that it is this bat. Um, humans have become the host um, due to interaction. It's thought that humans have become affected due to interactions in the wet markets of China. So um, the wet markets became more popular during this time in the search for more exotic foods. And then because of having these animals within those markets, there could be increased likelihood of having a zoonotic disease develop. Um, so, the, as we said, the first case was um, reported in November of 2002 in China, um, but there were, the reason that it sped, spread so quick is because there were a lot of what they called super spreaders, including um, uh, a man that was connected to uh, uh, 60 cases uh, that affected a hospital. Um, so he presented into the hospital. He affected uh, many, many healthcare workers, essentially all healthcare workers. Um, and that physician um, then later went to Hong Kong for a wedding where he himself became a super spreader, then spreading it to many hotel guests. Um, and then in those hotel guests were um, uh, kind of went back on to their, where their home locations were, um, one of which was in Canada, Toronto, Canada. And that's how we kind of got from um, November of when they think the, that it originally began in southern China to February of 2003 when SARS had kind of become a, a worldwide virus at that point. Um, the one point of, uh, that made it so capable of spreading was that it was spread through respiratory droplets. Once it, was, um, once it made its way to humans, it was able to, to spread, spread from human to human through the droplet, droplets. Um, and so this was the paper that kind of claimed to be the discovery of SARS. So this was by Nichols and um, in a paper called Clinical Virology and uh, SARS, the Clinical Virology and Pathogenesis. And it was published in 2003 in a journal called um, Respirology. But um, there was criticism at the, that point of uh, that this was a little bit delayed um, of recognition of the virus. And a lot of it was thought to be due to a lack of communication between Hong Kong University and the um, Institute of Respiratory Diseases, which was located in China. And, I, and um, a lot of it was due to some of the politics that were going on between China and Hong Kong at that time. <coughs> 
Um, so the next one is Nipah virus. So this was discovered in 1998. It's a febrile <coughs> illness with encephalitis um, noticed in, it was first noticed in Malaysia. Um, so at the same time of having the, the respiratory, the humans having the encephalitis and, and respiratory problems, they, were, they noticed that pigs were also getting sick and they called it the barking pig syndrome. Um, originally they thought that this infection was Japanese encephalitis, but it was later um, found to be a new paramyx of virus that they discovered you know, when they did CSF analysis. Um, in order to eradicate the disease, they had to kill off um, over a million pigs, and, which caused a lot of um, uh, loss of, of money and was um, pretty catastrophic to a lot of pig farmers in the area. Um, but in total, it caught, there were 276 cases reported um, and 106 were fatal. And no, more, um, no further cases have been reported in Malaysia at this time. The next outbreak was in India. So this occurred in 2001, and there were 66 humans at that time. Um, they, they're not sure that this was actually how the zoonotic event occurred at that point. So they, they didn't have the same connection with the pigs in the, uh, as they did in, in Malaysia. Um, and then in 2007, there was also an outbreak in India, but this was only um, one person that was infected um, by their aunt, and they, it resulted in four human-to-human -human transmissions. And at that point, it was known to be 100% um, fatality. So the place that, we, that Nipah virus still seems to be a problem is in Bangladesh. Um, so there have been repeated outbreaks since 2001. Um, and they have associated this with the uh, date palm sap that is um, often, they collect the um, date palms in the winter months. But the bats at that same time period have been known to drink the sap on the trees um, and cause human to, um, the thought is, is that because the bats are the, re the bats would be the reservoir um, causing infection of the sap and then the humans are able to, um, or come in contact with that sap and then you have the process of creating the zoonotic disease. Um, the other thing that makes it so important as we were discussing at the beginning of the lecture is that it also has human-to-human -human transfer. Um, so in 2004, there was an uh, outbreak and 94% of the cases at that time were reported as human-to-human -human transfer. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, the reservoir for Nipah virus is thought to be um, the flying fox. Um, and this is a type of fruit bat. Does anybody know what the other, um, one, another virus that the flying fox is a reservoir for? Ebola, right? Um, well, it's not proven not for, proven, yeah. Um, Hendra virus is another one. That, the Hendra virus is a virus that affects horses, in, or has been shown to affect horses in Australia. Um, and so they did a kind of, the, the, these two uh, viruses have been associated with the flying fox. Okay, so um, Ebola, we're, we obviously can't cover this. It's a huge, a huge talk in and of itself, and all of these, these topics were. Um, but we'll just kind of briefly discuss a few things. Um, so prior to 2013, a lot of Ebola outbreaks were sporadic. It wasn't until then that they, they um, that a lot of the um, kind of pandemic as we, we are aware of it today had occurred. So there's uh, five different types of um, Ebola strains that were discovered between 1976 and 2002. Um, the search for the reservoir is still ongoing. So as, as we mentioned, the thought is, is that it occurs in bats also, um, but there's been no definitive um, evidence, scientific evidence that's, that has definitely linked it. They have shown antibodies in some of the viruses, or, or in some of the um, bats, but not, no definitive evidence. Um, and then monkeys are thought to be, I think monkeys is what people traditionally think of as the likely reservoir or what was originally thought, but they're really a, an ac accidental host. Um, so there's two phases. Um, the first phase, you have about five to seven days of fevers, rash, joint pain, headache. Could, could be fever-like illness or many of the other viral illnesses that occur um, in the areas where Ebola is uh, present. The second phase is 
um, uh, the more severe illness with GI tract abnormalities like abdominal pain, diarrhea um, that can cause orthostatic hypertension, a lot of vascular system um, problems. It can cause you to go into a coma, CNS effects, and then the hemorrhagic manifestations that all occur later in the second phase of the disease. So I think why it, bec it became so important, I thought this, um, this is an older graph from um, when the epidemic was occurring in 2014, but it kind of shows how there, there were all these set that many outbreaks um, that dated um, back, but the 2014 epidemic was really where we saw a lot of deaths, and there were, there were greater than 25,000 people at that point um, affected, and greater than 10,000 people died. So it's really not known um, why or when the actual event occurred. There's a lot of theories, um, and we that we could talk about them all day or for a whole lecture about the theories on how um, the 2014 uh, epidemic occurred. But a few kind of important things I think to relate it to globalization and why we became more aware of some of the things or some of the effects of Ebola. Um, so in September of 2014. Um, the CDC confirmed the first laboratory um, Ebola case that came over to the United States and a man who had traveled from Dallas. And this is when um, there was a lot of hysteria related to, the, to Ebola and a lot of awareness of what Ebola was from the Amer general American population. Um, in, in October of 2014, there was a, um, a healthcare worker at Texas Presbyterian Hospital who provided uh, care for the index patient and w tested positive for Ebola. So that was the first time that they had shown that the person that was um, c came from Liberia um, infected an Ameri uh, American healthcare worker. Um, and then in, in October 2015, there was a second healthcare worker that ended up testing positive. But things were complicated by the fact that this healthcare worker had um, gotten on a, a flight on October 13th and um, they had to. Uh, uh, isolate the, the plane and, and watch those people for a total of 21 days too to see if anybody else was secondarily affected. So this is when we started um, uh, a lot of awareness in the United States was brought about um, to Ebola. Um, so at that time there were a lot of different news articles on, on if the Ebola was um, coming to the United States, and at that point it had a huge effect um, in Africa, um, but there, the news story seemed to be related to what was going to happen in the United States, and should we allow the infected uh, physicians and healthcare workers to come back into the country, um, and, and should we stop the flights and not allow people to come back. So I think this is when um, a lot of American citizens really became kind of more aware of, of what a zoonotic disease was and had an opinion on, on some of the politics that could, uh, uh, did ultimately affect the spread of Ebola. Um, at, as of January 2015, there were eight doctors, nurses, or kind of aid workers that had been brought back and treated, and um, only at that point had one of them died. Um, so, that was kind of a whirl whirlwind of zoonotic diseases. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts on any of them?